First, I wanted to say thank you to all of the organizers and volunteers for working on Boston. I'm really excited to be here, and I'm really excited for the weekend. So thanks for letting me be a part of that. Um, my name is Kay Adam White. I am the front end team manager at a travel agency downtown called Grand Circle Corporation. We do not use WordPress there, but I've been working with WordPress for client work for uh, three or four years. And something that I've been really excited about over the past couple of years is seeing how the front end technology that we use while we're building projects has changed. So this talk on the schedule is called um, like why we can have nice things. I changed the title last night because it's not really about whether there's nice things that we can use with WordPress or not anymore. We're all pretty familiar with that. There's a lot of cool things out there right now. The real question that I have is most of those are actually public facing. You know, HTML5, CSS3, we focus on the things, the technologies that let us build projects for our clients in a really good way. So, you know, new technologies, responsive design, um, better visual effects with CSS3, these are generally things that end up on our public facing site. Equally important, is um, finding ways to improve how we do what we do so that we can make better sites and um, do a better job for the clients that we work with. I'm a freelance, that's the angle I'm going to be coming at this from. Um, front of development does not look like it did a few years ago. Rebecca Murphy, who's a uh, developer for Boku Loft, uh, which is located here in Boston. She's based down in North Carolina. She posted an article a little while back called The Baseline for Front-end Developers, talking about how the skill sets have changed over the past couple of years. It's not really enough to know HTML, CSS, and jQuery anymore. You're going to want to have some familiarity with JavaScript itself, the core language, uh, the so-called good parts. You're also going to want to know at least a little bit about a bunch of supporting technologies. This is specifically for front-end application developers. So not all of it applies, but we've heard a lot about preprocessors like SAS and LESS. Um, there's the concept of client-side templating. You know, there's using JavaScript, you can put content onto the page using Ajax more performantly than you're used to doing with jQuery. You really want to make sure that you know source control if you're a developer these days, because if you're not able to work on an ongoing project and collaborate with people, you're not of much value. Um, a whole lot of ways to break code up and think about what one program needs in order to run. Interesting side note um, is that WordPress has actually been really good at dependency management because the WP and Q scripts function lets us explicitly specify whether something that we're writing depends on another script. So, you know, there's definitely areas in which this applies directly to what we do, areas in which it doesn't. Um, in browser developer tools, anyone who's done HTML in the past three or four years knows how valuable Firebug, Firebug and the WebKit inspector are. Um, the command line is getting less scary. It's become a very powerful tool for people that write CSS even. And I think that something that I'm hearing a lot over and over again is the importance of testing. These are just all the things that front-end development has come to mean. Um, process automation. I know Aaron Jordan's going to be talking later today about workflow and ways to automate your process. I'm really looking forward to that talk. Um, code quality tools, spell check your code essentially. And something that I find very important is documentation, both being able to create it and also understand how to work through it and how to find it. So really being a front-end developer has grown in scope. You're not just getting a comp from a designer, slicing it into HTML and CSS, and then finding a way to work with a back-end developer to render that, or doing it yourself through a WordPress template file. There's a lot of other things that you need to do. And the good news is the developers are lazy. So for every other thing you need to do in order to hit the different steps of the workflow that we have to consider now, someone's built a tool. In some cases, they've taken a very long time to build a tool. And we have some extremely good tools this year. CSS3 is an example. We love CSS3. There was a great presentation last year about it. There's going to be another talk tomorrow about um, updating Kubernetes to CSS3, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, this is, as I said, a client-facing technology in that it's one of the things that when you mention that a site has CSS3, people are beginning to build an association in their minds between, oh, they said that that's this new buzzword, and it looks really cool. This is um, 
not something that actually addresses the underlying problem of CSS, which is that it's kind of hard to write and maintain. So, you know, again, client-facing concerns, developer-facing concerns. CSS3 has, if anything, added more complexity to the style sheet process because suddenly you have to worry about vendor prefixes, dash webkit, dash box shadow. These are things that we didn't really have to worry about uh, in 2008 or 2007. Um, again, problem, someone built a tool. Style sheet preprocessors, I'm gonna try to talk about as an example of a technology that you can go out, look at, learn a little bit about, and find where in your workflow it's going to fit. This talk is not so much about what is cool, but rather, once you know what's cool, how to find a way to make it work for you. So, quick history of style sheet preprocessors. The basic idea is you write code in one format, and then it compiles to CSS. And the reason you do that is that it lets you use extra syntactical sugar. In this case, dollar sign blue is a variable. So you can define that particular hex value once and use it throughout your style sheets. This lets you make one change very, very quickly. If, this, if the client says, oh, I don't like that, let's make it red, you can only have to change it in one place. Better than find and replace, less code, less opportunity to make a mistake. SAS is about six years old. This is not new stuff. It's evolved a lot in that time, but it was born from the Hamel project, which was a similar attempt to make a more terse HTML syntax. It was written in Ruby, and um, it enforced certain conventions, like you know, no, you'll notice no curly braces. Things have to be indented a certain amount. This was kind of the initial stab at preprocessors around forcing you to write code that is going to be a little bit more structured, the same way that someone who comes from a C++ background will have stricter notions of how to structure their code than someone that does it in JavaScript. Less was, as far as I know, the second major style sheet preprocessor language. Um, the big difference in SAS are that it was fairly quickly shifted from being a Ruby project to being a JavaScript-based project. And it also started out having a syntax that was closer to CSS. The notion was, with less, you could rename your .css file into .less and start refactoring and just go and see how things go. Um, because it's written in JavaScript, you can use it on the command line, in this case using node.js, which is a JavaScript environment that runs on your computer. But you could also actually just include less.js in your page like you would any other script and this will interpret style sheets that you link. That's really only good for development because it's not fast, it's not something you want on a client site, but it made it really easy to get into this. It was a very low barrier of entry, and I've definitely, I, I think that SAS is more powerful in some ways, but I've seen a lot more or less out there these days. I don't know if that's true across the board, but in my experience. The SAS community started moving from SAS to less on the newbie level because it was more easier to get into. So that group eventually came out with version 3, which introduced sassy CSS syntax. This is exactly the same as the first example, except that it's actually also, you can use valid CSS in here because you have your curly brackets back. It's not indentation sensitive. You've got your semicolons. This brought back a lot of the familiarity that people were finding lacking with the first version. And since then, they've been developed in tandem. You can use either one. It's really a matter of what works for you. I'm compelled to mention Stylus. It's the third kid on the block. I don't actually know a whole lot about it. I'm curious, from the audience's standpoint, if anyone's using this and finds it to be valuable for your workflow, I'll get in touch with you later this weekend. I'd love to learn a little bit more about it. So you know, those are three new technologies that let us do what we do in a more structured way. There's a lot of things about them that, that one might be cooler than another, might be easier to get into than another, I happen to use less. That's what I personally found to work the best with my workflow. It translates really well when I'm doing stuff with WordPress to when I'm doing stuff in .NET using the enterprise content management systems. It's just got a lot of ports and adaptations that make it very convenient in those environments. Your mileage may vary. I know a lot of people that swear by SAS. Do a quick run through of these. Um, and then sort of get into the, the second portion of the talk. All of these tools give you certain ways that you can structure your code more efficiently. So in addition to variables, you can also nest your rules. Rather than doing dot widget spam 
dot widget a, dot widget a colon hover, you can break it out into an indented syntax that lets you pretty quickly visually see, oh, this is a part of that, this is a part of that. If you don't have to type that class name over and over again, you reduce the risk that you're going to mistype it. It makes it easier to see whether you have two selectors that are the same, because there's if it's just dot widget and then somewhere else you have dot widget, you think, oh, maybe I can combine those. Since there's less repetition, differences stand out more. It's, they also give you a couple nice tools to um, handle things like uh, pseudo selectors. That ampersand actually refers to the containing rule. So you can do a open, open block ampersand colon hover gives you a widget a colon hover for that hover selector. Um, you can do the same thing with the class name. It, it just acts like you've written out the rule. So that's one kind of neat thing. Math is also something that you're capable of doing with these style sheets. This, you know, a lot of people have wished when they were doing things like 960 grid system that they could just say, this is half of that, or this is that plus 20 pixels. That's actually possible with less than SAS. And this is part of why style sheet preprocessors are a great foundation for some of the grid frameworks we're seeing these days. Twitter Bootstrap, an extremely popular, it's actually the number one projects on GitHub right now, is based on less. And at least part of that is that that makes it very convenient to build anything based on the grid system. It makes it very convenient to use typography and to build widgets within your style sheet because you have fewer points of contact with your code. Less code is more maintainable. Similar idea about less code. If you need to use something over and over again, for example, rounded selectors, this is really, for a lot of people, a killer feature of these. Rather than having to list out every single um, uh, vendor prefix, and I should probably put operator in here too, um, although they probably support order radius by now. Um, you can write one, what's called a mix-in, which essentially serves as a function. And this block, wherever that dot rounded corners occurs, that block will get expanded. So again, the notion that you take things that you might be writing throughout your style sheet, font stacks, um, type definitions, break them out into a component that you can reuse. This, to me, is what's really different about front-end development now versus a few years ago, is that we're considering maintainability, we're considering how we can go about doing this in a way where we can continue to use it, we can continue to build upon it, and other people can work on it with us. This sort of thing is excellent for team projects. Because you don't have to go looking to say, oh, I wonder what style they used on that, um, like, you know, that consultant we had last month. What did they do for that rounded corner? So you can just drop in that mix in and know that it's going to be the same. The one killer feature for me that SAS has that I wish less had is called extends. So it's kind of like a mix in plus. Rather than having the same code expanded wherever you put it, which does lead to larger CSS file sizes, which eventually down the road would generate lower, slower page loads, extends gives you a really nice way to say one class that you're working with is meant to be based on another. And the way that that plays out in the code is that if you put extend widget on your error, that selector is going to get appended at build time so that you have one selector with both rules. This means smaller file size. Other than that, it's not very different. But it's enough of a change that there's actually a campaign to get this built into less in an upcoming version. If you're interested in understanding that conversation, when I post the slides, this link at the bottom is actually to GitHub where there is a open feature request for this and a conversation is going on about bringing this into less. So um, my one attempt at changing the fate of the internet. Um, these work with a whole bunch of tools. Tools beget tools. Less became Bootstrap. Well, it didn't become, but it's the foundation of Bootstrap. SAS has a really, really useful set of utilities called Compass. A lot of people that I know that use SAS use it because Compass lets them do things like automatically build sprite sheets. Really powerful automated stuff that you wouldn't be able to have if you didn't have a community that is actively working on these problems and actively trading knowledge. The awesome thing about what we're doing now is that we are becoming a community. And it's been that way for a while. WordPress people are used to that. We've been a group for a long time now. WordCamps are a great opportunity to see everyone in different parts of the world. But the front end community is rallying around certain projects. jQuery was the first major one in, um, in this area that I'm aware of. But 
um, backbone, uh, different model view frameworks. These are things that they might just be buzzwords, but they're also a pointer to a group of people that is, has shares similar concerns and is working on the same sorts of problems. So style sheet preprocessors. A lot of you may be familiar with them. Actually, I'm kind of curious. How many of you use these? Okay, a number of people. They're really cool. They're at least worth trying because they are a cool thing that lets you make even cooler things. The easier it is for you to make your site, the faster you can do it, the more features you can add, the better the response might be from the client. And it's all due to the fact that Frontends now has a build process. There's an old, uh, I forget who uh, said it first, but there's a joke that the compile process for JavaScript is to hit reload. That's not really true anymore. You can still do it that way, depending on what tools you use, but by adding one or two small steps that are really flexible, you can get a lot more power. This starts at the preprocessor <coughs> level, then you minify your code so that it's going to be smaller when it's downloaded, resulting in faster load times. Take all of your style sheets, bake them into one file so that that's one HTTP request. That way your browser can do more at once. And just we're doing a lot of stuff to our code that lets us be more effective. And the awesome thing about this is that we're front-end people, so because these aren't really low-level languages, it doesn't even take that long. You can't really use, I'm compiling a less file as an excuse, unless maybe you had millions of lines. And at that point, you're probably not writing good CSS. The other awesome thing is that however complex your workflow is, or however simple, there's going to be a way to fit this type of thing in. And I'm using preprocessors as an example. There's a lot of tools out there that each would be worth their own talk that make our workflow easier. I know that um, there's going to be a couple talks this weekend that are getting into process workflow, automating your deployment with Git. These sorts of things, really, all you need to do is hear about them enough until you start thinking about how you can use them in your project. And when you do, they can go wherever you want. Less can be used via the command line, as I said. If you have a less file, all you have to do is run it through a command that runs on top of Node, and it'll compile that file for you. Um, Demo.less is just a demo file from the less website with a couple basic rules. And you type that command, and it gets outputted. Output. Output out. You can also pipe that to a file. This is the sort of thing that you can write a rule to automate or build into an existing build process. You can have your text editor run this command for you every time you save. And if there is an error, if there is something that doesn't make sense, well, that works, but trust me, it's possible to break these. And when you do, it'll complain and it'll throw an error. And that way, you know that you've done something wrong. You can do this manually if you're not comfortable with the command line. There's applications where it's just a drag and drop. As I said, you can have this integrated into your text editor. Um, I use Sublime Text, which is a comparatively newcomer to the text editor world, but they have a plugin in the um, package control system, which is a less build system. You can do this on the server. Less has been ported to both .NET and PHP. As I said before, this is why I use it. It lets me take one technology and use it across different environments in the same way. There's actually libraries out there that will let you compile on the server. Whenever someone makes a request, it'll say, hey, have my style sheets changed? If so, compile them down and cache that. There's actually a WordPress plugin for this. And I learned earlier today that there's also page lines, which is they're out in the um, center area. They're built on top of Twitter Bootstrap, and they've built this less compilation process into their system. So there's a lot of different ways to get at this. If you do have a WordPress site and you do use, and I was just trying out the um, plugin that I was referencing, all that it does is it listens for WP and Q styles and then fires off a, um, it compiles it and stores the file whenever you save um, or whenever you try to hit the site so that it's really easy for you to just write your style sheets 
and forget about it. If it doesn't load, you probably have a build error, and then you can check that. But if you do, the one downside is that currently this plugin only works on the WP hook. Um, I think people are trying to make it compatible with WP and Q scripts. Um, but once you add that action, when you reload, it'll load and compile that style sheet. And you'll be able to see those changes in real time as you make adjustments. So, if you come to your senses, <laughs> you'll just have those update in real time. And you basically can, again, without even having to go into the JavaScript side of things, use your style sheets and this new syntax the same way that you would have all along. Again, you could also include less.js. Um, I think that I like the server-side version better because it's just a little bit faster. Really, what matters is that when you're looking at something like style sheet preprocessors or any other buzzword, node, comes to mind, find a way that it can support you. There's a lot of these tools that are designed to do things that don't necessarily correspond to WordPress. Node is a JavaScript environment in which you write a web server. WordPress generally runs on Apache or something like that, IIS on the Windows system. You don't need to reinvent the wheel, but you can find a way to use things like less so that Node can let you do your job better, even if it's not being used necessarily for its original use case. And of course, all of these tools, the one thing that all of those preprocessors have in common is GitHub. How many people are familiar with Git? Almost everyone. So, all right, a lot of this you probably know already. But um, what I wanted to get across for anyone that is new in this area is that GitHub is the de facto standard for front-end development. Every major front-end project, whether it's a style sheet preprocessor, JavaScript library, they're almost exclusively on GitHub these days. There's a couple that are primarily on Google code, um, but it has effectively the version control war for JavaScript. And GitHub, more importantly, is really, really good about evangelizing and supporting people to learn their technology. So they have a, they just released in the past month, a course on code school where you can take a quick course and ramp up on Git and have it walk you through the process of how to use it. They've released Mac and Windows applications to make a graphical interface that integrates with your operating system that lets you use GitHub more effectively. Um, and it's getting traction even outside of normal projects. Mark Jaquith set up the official WordPress mirror. A lot of other open source projects might have a mirror on Git even if they're using SVN or some other system under the hood. So again, knowing that GitHub is the JavaScript community's home, what does that mean for us? How can we use that to get more interesting tools? We can use GitHub itself. It has code review tools. It has something called a pull request. These are ways that you can look at code that someone is working on for your project and comment on it, discuss it. The way that GitHub uses pull requests is that they actually will open this. The concept of a pull request is that you've made a change and that change is encapsulated, and that change as a whole can be brought into the project if it's approved. So what they do is they start by saying, we're going to have a feature. They open the request right then, before any code has been written, and then they use that as their system of record for all of the modifications they're making. This image, I don't even know how many commits and comments and screenshots there are, but it was for when they were building out GitHub pages. And the idea was that, Every time they had a new design document or a comp, they put it in the pull request, and that became a repository of the thought process that was more tightly tied to their code than a wiki would be. Normally, you do this sort of thing with the wiki or with the design document. Having it in a pull request is something that my team's found very valuable from a process standpoint so that you can go to a particular commit, figure out what that was a part of, and see exactly what you were discussing at the time. Very powerful tools, and as far as I know, GitHub's doing a better job of this than anyone else. They also have bug trackers, they do have wikis, they have some the concept of a gist, which if you're not familiar with it, is like GitHub, most projects are a repository, which has history and contributors and you can pull to and from. 
a gist is really just kind of a one-off. You can still make um, edits to it and get uh, different versions, but it's meant for smaller things, demos, that sort of project. And GitHub, from my standpoint, has really brought back the README. Documentation is the biggest thing that I can stress about how we can do better as a community to make good tools for ourselves and others. And documentation is far more than just writing a readme file, but it's a good start. This is grunt.js, which is a JavaScript-based build system written by uh, Ben Allman at Cowboy on Twitter, who works for Boku downtown. Um, if I mention those guys, it's because I work across the street from them and I see them in the coffee shop and stuff. Um, it's got your Git repository, but then it has a readme that talks about getting started. It's got lists of what you can do, explanation for why the project is there, how to install it, a release history. This is front and center with GitHub. It's not just something that you're prompted to read at the end of the install process. I don't know how many times I've clicked, unchecked that open readme box when I'm installing software over the past decade. But with GitHub, it's actually becoming a useful tool because every time that you have a project like this, it prompts you to add a readme, and that readme's existence hopefully encourages you to start writing exactly why it's there. If you want to do a full page documentation, you can. This is Les's page. It gives you a lot of more in-depth detail. And of course, projects like jQuery have whole sites explaining how to use them. But it still helps to have an explanatory readme. jQuery's is not about how to develop the software with jQuery. They don't tell you how to use the selectors. They presume that if you're looking at their GitHub repository, you know or are capable of finding out how to do that. What they want to tell you here is very specifically, how do you interact with this code? Because we're used to taking jQuery, downloading it, and dropping it in our projects. A readme can be a lot more. It can be, once you download this, how do you install it? They're using Node here and then Grunt to install, test, compile jQuery into its different parts. The new version actually lets you exclude different elements of functionality that you don't need. And this is all done through a command line build process. Tools to support tools. So as I said, move, we're moving beyond code comments. If you look at something like Less or Node, you can look through the API reference, but that doesn't necessarily tell you how to use it in your project. That doesn't tell you how to use it with WordPress. You really need to sort of start to see how people are using this in the real world. You need to see examples. You need to sort of learn what you think it should be used to do, and then you can find where in your process to drop it in. Style guides are really helpful things when you're looking at a project. If it has a style guide, that might communicate information about why that was written a certain way. The notion that we're a community now, communities have ground rules. When you're developing group software, WordPress, JavaScript, jQuery, really whatever you're working on, having a style guide that is going to govern and structure the way that you write your code is going to make life easier for everyone. You don't have to agree with them, but if you're working on a project, it behooves you to abide by theirs. There's a lot of good ones out there. There's maybe half a dozen that are really got a lot of traction in the JavaScript space. I've seen a number for other languages as well. As far as I know, Twitter Bootstrap actually started, at least in part, to serve as a style guide for Twitter, and then that began to expand into a framework. So this is actually an in-progress version of WordPress, uh, the WordPress uh, UI groups CSS coding standards. Style guides are not just an argument about whether you put a semicolon at the end of the line or not. It's really about, this is how our code is going to be structured so that we don't even have to think about this, and we can talk about how to use it and how to build on top of it. Unit tests are very similar. If you're working on a group project, you might know, not know about all the functionality. So things like jQuery, if you're going to take a copy of that and start developing it yourself, they have a series of what's called a unit test, which is a very short snippet of code that is designed to prove that one very small component of the tool works. And by running all of these, you can verify that you haven't broken anything. So the primary community concern is just about you know, 
being energetic and excited about building software so that you challenge people to do a good job on their end and you're willing to contribute. You don't have to be an open source junkie to appreciate how much of a change it has brought to our industry. And a lot of that is because there's a lot of very passionate people driving projects like WordPress and their contributions and their energy makes everything better for the rest of us. We're kind of tag clouds when we're at conferences. We're just constant flow of information. We're hearing a lot about you know, this buzzword, that buzzword, responsive design, CSS3, marketing, blogging, all of these vendors that we keep hearing about, um, tools, plugins. It's really what I want to get at, and I know this might have been a little bit basic for some of you, is that I really passionately believe that tools that help us make tools are the big thing over the past year. Because HTML5 has been getting, gaining steam and it's not going to go anywhere. The neat stuff that we're using to build our client sites is only going to keep getting better. I work for a company that caters to retired Americans 65 and up. We dropped support for IE7 last week. We are in the future. <laughs> and <laughs> I love that. And if there's one thing that I can say going into WordCamp, it's that I'm really excited to see the themes and the topics that get mentioned again and again here and find ways to bring them into what I do and I hope that you feel the same. So thank you. PHP and um, something called .less, which is a .NET port of it. I don't know if it's better server side. Don't quote me on that because, I, as I said, it's what I use, so I'm not really familiar with the alternatives. But there are ports out there in different languages that let you compile things on the server. Thank you. Any other questions? Yep. So as a, a newbie for the development side, I've been a long time front end developer, and I'm starting to work with WordPress here. The first one and all that. Is this, uh, are these all based on having to at least, at minimum, be CSS3 and HTML5? Nope. Mm -hmm. You can use this to write HTML4, my click is not working, HTML4, CSS2. It's really all of these tools that I'm talking about are about your process while you're developing. So you could be just writing jQuery plugins, and it's still helpful to have a tool like Grunt because if you have a plugin, you can just generate a scaffolding for, all right, well, I'm not gonna worry about why that's not working, but you, there's tools where you can just generate really quickly a scaffold for what you're doing and just go. And it saves you time, it removes the number of things you have to think about. So it's not, I, I mentioned CSS3 because it's hot and it's cool, this is sort of the flip side of that. There's neat stuff that doesn't depend on what's client facing. And even if you're building a site that has to work on a Nokia from three years ago, our admin interfaces, we have a lot more control over being able to use new stuff on the admin side, on the tooling side, because it's only pointing at us. It's not pointing at our clients. Does that help? Well, thank you. I'm going to be out back if you have any other questions. Have a good day.